Brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Stan Lee. Stan Lee is an American comic book writer, editor, and publisher, who was formerly executive vice president and publisher of Marvel Comics. In collaboration with several artists, including Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, he co-created Spider-Man, The Hulk, Doctor Strange, The Fantastic Four, Iron Man, Daredevil, Thor, The X-Men, and many other fictional characters. Introducing a thoroughly shared universe into superhero comic books. In addition, he challenged the comics industry's censorship organization, the Comics Code Authority, indirectly leading to it updating its policies. Lee subsequently led the expansion of Marvel Comics, from a small division of a publishing house to a large multimedia corporation. He was inducted into the comic book industry's Will Eisner Award Hall of Fame in 1994 and the Jack Kirby Hall of Fame in 1995. Lee received a National Medal of Arts in 2008. Early Life Stanley Martin Lieber was born on December 28, 1922 in New York City, U.S. In the apartment of his Romanian-born Jewish immigrant parents, Celia and Jack Lieber, at the corner of West 98th Street and West End Avenue in Manhattan. His father, trained as a dress cutter, worked only sporadically after the Great Depression, and the family moved further uptown to Fort Washington Avenue, in Washington Heights, Manhattan. Lee has one younger brother named Larry Lieber. He said in 2006 that as a child he was influenced by books and movies, particularly those with Errol Flynn playing heroic roles. By the time Lee was in his teens, the family was living in a one-bedroom apartment at 1720 University Avenue in the Bronx. Lee has described it as a third-floor apartment facing out back, with he and his brother sharing a bedroom and his parents using a fold-out couch. Lee attended Jewett Clinton High School in the Bronx. In his youth, Lee enjoyed writing, and entertained dreams of one day writing the great American novel. He has said that in his youth he worked such part-time jobs as writing obituaries for a news service and press releases for the National Tuberculosis Center, delivering sandwiches for the Jack May Pharmacy to offices in Rockefeller Center, working as an office boy, for a trouser manufacturer, ushering at the Rivoli Theater on Broadway, and selling subscriptions to the New York Herald Tribune newspaper. He graduated from high school early, aged 16 and a half in 1939, and joined the WPA Federal Theater Project. Early career With the help of his uncle Robbie Solomon, Lee became an assistant in 1939 at the new Timely Comics division of Pulp Magazine and comic book publisher Martin Goodman's company. Timely, by the 1960s, would evolve into Marvel Comics. Lee, whose cousin Jean was Goodman's wife, was formally hired by Timely editor Joe Simon. His duties were prosaic at first. In those days, the artists dipped the pen in ink, so I had to make sure the ink wells were filled, Lee recalled in 2009. I went down and got them the lunch. I did proofreading. I erased the pencils from the finished pages for them, marshalling his childhood ambition to be a writer. Young Stanley Lieber made his comic book debut with the text filler Captain America Foils the Traitor's Revenge in Captain America Comics. Using the pseudonym Stan Lee, which years later he would adopt as his legal name, Lee later explained in his autobiography and numerous other sources that he had intended to save his given name for more literary work. This initial story also introduced Captain America's trademark ricocheting shield toss. 
he graduated from writing filler to actual comics with a backup feature, headline, Hunter. Foreign Correspondent, two issues later. Lee's first superhero co-creation was The Destroyer, in Mystic Comics. Other characters he co-created during this period fans and historians call the golden age of comic books include Jack Frost, debuting in USA Comics, and Father Time, debuting in Captain America Comics. When Simon and his creative partner Jack Kirby left late in 1941, following a dispute with Goodman, the 30-year-old publisher installed Lee, just under 19 years old, as interim editor. The youngster showed a knack for the business that led him to remain as the comic book division's editor-in-chief, as well as art director. For much of that time, until 1972, when he would succeed Goodman as publisher, Lee entered the United States Army in early 1942 and served in the U.S. in the Signal Corps, repairing telegraph poles and other communications equipment. He was later transferred to the Training Film Division, where he worked writing manuals, training films, and slogans, and occasionally cartooning. His military classification, he says, was playwright. He adds that only nine men in the U.S. Army were given that title. Vincent Fago, editor of Timely's Animation Comics section, which put out humor and funny animal comics, filled in until Lee returned from his World War II military service in 1945. In the mid-1950s, by which time the company was now generally known as Atlas Comics. Lee wrote stories in a variety of genres including romance, westerns, humor, science fiction, medieval adventure, horror and suspense. In the 1950s, Lee teamed up with his comic book colleague Dan DiCarlo to produce the syndicated newspaper strip. My Friend Irma, based on the radio comedy starring Marie Wilson. By the end of the decade, Lee had become dissatisfied with his career and considered quitting the field. Marvel Revolution In the late 1950s, DC Comics editor Julius Schwartz revived the superhero archetype and experienced a significant success with its updated version of The Flash, and later, with Super Team The Justice League of America. In response, publisher Martin Goodman assigned Lee to create a new superhero team. Lee's wife urged him to experiment with stories he preferred, since he was planning on changing careers and had nothing to lose. Lee acted on that advice giving his superheroes a flawed humanity, a change from the ideal archetypes that were typically written for pre-teens. Before this, most superheroes were idealistically perfect people with no serious, lasting problems. Lee introduced complex, naturalistic characters who could have bad tempers, fits of melancholy, and vanity. They bickered amongst themselves, worried about paying their bills, and impressing girlfriends, got bored or even worse sometimes physically ill. The first superhero group Lee and artist Jack Kirkby created was the Fantastic Four. The team's immediate popularity led Lee and Marvel's illustrators to produce a cavalcade of new titles. Again, working with Kirby, Lee co-created the Hull, Thor, Iron Man, and the X-Men, with Bill Everett, Daredevil, and with Steve Ditko, Doctor Strange, and Marvel's most successful character, Spider-Man, all of whom lived in a thoroughly shared universe. Lee and Kirby gathered several of the newly created characters together into the team titled The Avengers and would revive characters from the 1940s such as the Submariner and Captain America. Comics historian Peter Sanderson wrote that in the 1960s, Lee's revolution extended beyond the characters and storylines to the way in which comic books engaged the readership and built a sense of community between fans and creators. 
He introduced the practice of regularly including a credit panel on the splash page of each story, naming not just the writer and penciler, but also the inker and letterer. Regular news about Marvel staff members and upcoming storylines was presented on the Bullpen Bulletins page, which was written in a friendly, chatty style. Lee has said that his goal was for fans to think of the comics creators as friends and considered it a mark of his success on this front that, at a time when letters to other comics publishers were typically addressed, Dear Editor, letters to Marvel addressed the creators by first name. By 1967, the brand was well enough ensconced in popular culture that a March 3 WBAI radio program with Lee and Kirby as guests was titled, Will Success Spoil Spider-Man? Sick. Throughout the 1960s, Lee scripted, art directed and edited most of Marvel's series, moderated the letters pages, wrote a monthly column called, Stan's Soapbox, and wrote endless promotional copy, often signing off with his trademark motto, Excelsior, to maintain his workload and meet deadlines, he used a system that was used previously by various comic book studios, but due to Lee's success with it became known as the Marvel Method. Typically, Lee would brainstorm a story with the artist and then prepare a brief synopsis rather than a full script. Based on the synopsis, the artist would fill the allotted number of pages by determining and drawing the panel-to-panel -panel storytelling. After the artist turned in penciled pages, Lee would write the word balloons and captions, and then oversee the lettering and coloring. In effect, the artists were co-plotters, whose collaborative first drafts Lee built upon. Lee recorded messages to the newly formed Merry Marvel Marching Society fan club in 1965. Following Dick Cost's departure from Marvel in 1966, John Romita Sr. became Lee's collaborator on The Amazing Spider-Man. Within a year, it overtook Fantastic Four to become the company's top seller. Lee and Romita's stories focused as much on the social and college lives of the characters as they did on Spider-Man's adventures. The stories became more topical, addressing issues such as the Vietnam War, political elections, and student activism. Robbie Robertson, introduced in The Amazing Spider-Man 1 was one of the first African-American characters in comics to play a serious supporting role. In the Fantastic Four series, the lengthy run by Lee and Kirby produced many acclaimed storylines as well as characters that have become central to Marvel, including the Inhumans and the Black Panther, an African king who would be mainstream comics' first black superhero. The story frequently cited as Lee and Kirby's finest achievement is the three-part Galactus trilogy, that began in Fantastic Four 8, chronicling the arrival of Galactus a cosmic giant who wanted to devour the planet, and his herald, the Silver Surfer. Fantastic Four 8 was chosen as 4 in the 100 Greatest Marvels of All Time poll of Marvel's readers in 2001. Editor Robert Greenberg wrote in his introduction to the story that, as the fourth year of the Fantastic Four came to a close, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby seemed to be only warming up. In retrospect, it was perhaps the most fertile period of any monthly title. During the Marvel Age, comics historian Les Daniels noted that, T, he mystical, and metaphysical elements that took over the saga were perfectly suited to the tastes of young readers in the 1960s, and Lee soon discovered that the story was a favorite on college campuses. Lee and artist John Buscema launched the Silver Surfer series in August 1968. The following year, Lee and Jean Colin created The Falcon, comics' first African-American superhero in Captain America 17. Then in 1971, Lee indirectly helped reform the comics code, 
the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare had asked Lee to write a comic book story about the dangers of drugs, and Lee conceived a three-issue subplot in The Amazing Spider-Man 698, in which Peter Parker's best friend becomes addicted to pills. The Comics Code Authority refused to grant its seal, because the stories depicted drug use. The anti-drug context was considered irrelevant, with Goodman's cooperation, and confident that the original government request would give him credibility. Lee had the story published without the seal. The comics sold well and Marvel won praise for its socially conscious efforts. The CCA subsequently loosened the code to permit negative depictions of drugs, among other new freedoms. Lee also supported using comic books to provide some measure of social commentary about the real world, often dealing with racism and bigotry. Stan's Soapbox, besides promoting an upcoming comic book project, also addressed issues of discrimination, intolerance, or prejudice. In 1972, Lee stopped writing monthly comic books to assume the role of publisher. His final issue of The Amazing Spider-Man was 10 and his last Fantastic Four was 25. Later career in later years, Lee became a figurehead and public face for Marvel Comics. He made appearances at comic book conventions around America, lecturing at colleges, and participating in panel discussions. Lee and John Romita Sr. launched the Spider-Man newspaper comic strip on January 3, 1977. Lee's final collaboration with Jack Kirby, The Silver Surfer, The Ultimate Cosmic Experience, was published in 1978 as part of the Marvel Fireside Books series and is considered to be Marvel's first graphic novel. Lee and Don Buscema produced the first issue of The Savage She-Hulk, which introduced the female cousin of the Hulk and crafted a Silver Surfer story. For Epic Illustrated, he moved to California in 1981 to develop Marvel's TV and movie properties. He has been an executive producer for, and has a made cameo appearances in, Marvel film adaptations and other movies. He occasionally returned to comic book writing, with various Silver Surfer projects including a 1982 one-shot drawn by John Byrne. The Judgment Day graphic novel illustrated by John Buscema, the Parable Limited series drawn by French artist Mobius, and the Enslavers graphic novel with Keith Pollard. Lee was briefly president of the entire company, but soon stepped down to become publisher instead, finding that being president was too much about numbers and finance, and not enough about the creative process he enjoyed. Peter Paul, and Lee began a new internet-based superhero creation, production, and marketing studio, Stan Lee Media, in 1998. It grew to 165 people and went public through a reverse merger structured by investment banker Stan Medley in 1999, but, near the end of 2000, Investigators discovered illegal stock manipulation by Paul and corporate officer Stephen Gordon. Stanley Media filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in February 2001. Paul was extradited to the U.S. from Brazil and pleaded guilty to violating Sec Rule 10b-5 in connection with trading of his stock in Stanley Media. Lee was never implicated in the scheme. In 2001, Lee, Jill Champion, and Arthur Lieberman formed POW Entertainment to develop film, television, and video game properties. Lee created the Riskway animated superhero series Stripper Ayla for Spike TV. In 2004, POW Entertainment went public. Also that year, Lee announced a superhero program that would feature Ringo Starr, the former Beatle as the lead character. Additionally, in August of that year, 
Lee announced the launch of Stan Lee's Sunday Comics, a short-lived subscription service hosted by ComicWorks.com. On March 15, 2007, after Stan Lee Media had been purchased by Jim Nesfield, the company filed a lawsuit against Marvel Entertainment for $5 billion claiming Lee had given his rights to several Marvel characters to Stan Lee Media in exchange for stock and a salary. On June 9, 2007, Stan Lee Media sued Lee, his new company, POW Entertainment, and POW subsidiary QED Entertainment. In 2008, Lee wrote humorous captions. For the political humor tea book Stan Lee presents election days, what are they really saying? In April of that year, Brighton Partners and Rainmaker Animation announced a partnership POW to produce a CGI film series, Legion of Five. Other projects by Lee announced in the late 2000s included a line of superhero comics for Virgin Comics a TV adaptation of the novel Hero, a forward to Skyscraperman by Skyscraper Fire Safety Advocate, and Spider-Man fan Dan Goodwin, a partnership with Guardian Media Entertainment, and the Guardian Project to create NHL superhero mascots and work. With the Eagle Initiative program to find new talent in the comic book field, in October, Lee announced he would partner with 1821 Comics on a multimedia imprint for children. Stan Lee's Kids Universe, a move he said addressed the lack of comic books targeted for that demographic, and that he was collaborating with the company on its futuristic graphic novel Romeo and Juliet, The War, by writer Max Work and artist Scan Sri Suwan At the 2012 San Diego Comic Con International, Lee announced his YouTube channel, Stan Lee's World of Heroes, which airs programs created by Lee, Mark Hamill, Peter David, Adrienne Curry, and Bonnie Burton among others. Lee wrote the book, Zodiac released in January 2015, with Stuart Moore. The film Stan Lee's Annihilator, based on a Chinese prisoner-turned-superhero named Ming and in production since 2013, is set for a 2015 release. In his later career, Lee's contributions continued to expand outside the style that he helped pioneer. An example of this is his first work for DC Comics in the 2000s, launching the Just Imagine series in which Lee reimagined the DC superheroes Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and The Flash. Manga projects involving Lee include Karakori Doji Ultimo, a collaboration with Hiroyuki Take, Viz Media and Shuisha, and Hiroman, serialized in Square Enix Monthly Shonen Gangan with the Japanese company Bones. In 2011, Lee started writing a live-action musical, The Yin and Yang Battle of Tao. This period also saw a number of collaborators honor Lee for his influence on the comics industry. In 2006, Marvel commemorated Lee's 65 years with the company by publishing a series of one-shot comics starring Lee himself meeting and interacting with many of his co-creations, including Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, The Thing, Silver Surfer, and Doctor Doom. These comics also featured short pieces by such comics creators as Joss Whedon and Fred Hembeck, as well as reprints of classically written adventures. At the 2007 Comic-Con International, Marvel Legends introduced a Stan Lee action figure, the body beneath the figure's removable cloth wardrobe is a reused mold of a previously released Spider-Man action figure, with minor changes. Kamikaze Expo, Los Angeles' largest comic book convention, was rebranded as Stan Lee's Kamikaze presented by PAL Entertainment in 2012. At the 2016 Comic-Con International, Lee introduced his digital graphic novel Stan Lee's God Woke, 
with text originally written as a poem he presented at Carnegie Hall in 1972. The print book version won the 2017 Independent Publisher Book Awards Outstanding Books of the Year Independent Voice Award. Charity Work the Stan Lee Foundation was founded in 2010 to focus on literacy, education, and the arts. Its stated goals include supporting programs and ideas that improve access to literacy resources, as well as promoting diversity, national literacy, culture and the arts. Stan Lee has donated portions of his personal effects to the University of Wyoming. At various times, between 1981 and 2001. Fictional portrayals Stan Lee and his collaborator Jack Kirby appear as themselves in the Fantastic Four Zero, the first of several appearances within the fictional Marvel Universe. The two are depicted as similar to the real world counterparts, creating comic books based on the Real Adventures of the Fantastic Four. Lee was parodied by Kirby in comics published by rival DC Comics as Funky Flashman. Kirby later portrayed himself, Lee, production executive Sol Brodsky, and Lee's secretary Flo Steinberg as superheroes in What If One. What if the Marvel bullpen had become the Fantastic Four, in which Lee played the part of Mr. Fantastic? Lee has also made numerous cameo appearances in many Marvel titles, appearing in audiences and crowds at many characters' ceremonies and parties, and hosting an old soldier's reunion in Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos OO. Lee appeared, unnamed, as the priest at Louis Cage and Jessica Jones' wedding in New Avengers Annual. He pays his respects to Karen Page at her funeral in Daredevil Vol. 2, and appears in The Amazing Spider-Man 69. In 1994, artist Alex Ross rendered Lee as a bar patron on page 44 of Marvel's In Marvel's Flashback series of titles cover dated July 1997. A top-hatted caricature of Lee as a ringmaster introduced stories that detailed events in Marvel. Characters lives before they became superheroes, in special, one, editions of many Marvel titles. The ringmaster depiction of Lee was originally from Generation X7, where the character narrated a story set primarily in an abandoned circus. Though the story itself was written by Scott Lobdell, the narration by Ringmaster Stan was written by Lee, and the character was drawn in that issue by Chris Bachelow. Lee and other comics creators are mentioned on page 479 of Michael Chabin's 2000 novel about the comics. Industry The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Chabon also acknowledges a debt to Lee and other creators on the book's author's note page. On one of the last pages of Truth, Red, White and Black, Lee appears in a real photograph among other celebrities on a wall of the Bradley home. Under his given name of Stanley Lieber, Stan Lee appears briefly in Paul Malmont's 2006 novel The Chinatown Death Cloud Peril. In Stan Lee Meets Superheroes, which Lee wrote, he comes into contact with some of his favorite creations. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby appear as professors in Marvel Adventures Spider-Man 9. In La Vie Tigard's 2013 The Violent Century, Lee appears under his birth name of Stan Lee Martin Lieber as a historian of superhumans. Film and Television Appearances Lee has had cameo appearances in many Marvel film and television projects. A few of these appearances are self-aware, and sometimes reference Lee's involvement in the creation of certain characters. Lee has been accredited executive producer on most Marvel film and television projects. 
since the 1990 direct-to-video Captain America film. Warner Brothers, DC Properties in the original February 7, 1998, broadcast airing of the Superman, the animated series episode Apocalypse, now, part 2, on the kids' WB programming block. An animated funky Flashman was visible mourning the death of Daniel, terrible, Turpin. A character based on his longtime Marvel Comics collaborator Jack Kirby. This shot was later modified to remove the likeness of Lee and other of background Marvel characters when the episode was released on DVD. Personal Life Lee was raised in a Jewish family. In a 2002 survey of whether he believes in God, he stated, Well, let me put it this way. Pauses, no, I'm not going to try to be clever. I really don't know. I just don't know. From 1945 to 1947, Lee lived in the rented top floor of a brownstone in the East 90s in Manhattan. He married Joan Clayton Bucock on December 5, 1947, and in 1949, the couple bought a two-story, three-bedroom home at 1084 West Broadway in Woodmere, New York, on Long Island. Living there through 1952, their daughter Joan Celia J. C. Lee was born in 1950. Another child, daughter Yan Lee, died three days after delivery in 1953. The Lees resided at 226 Richards Lane in the Long Island town of Hewlett Harbor, New York, from 1952 to 1980. They also owned a two-bedroom condominium on the 14th floor of 220 East 63rd Street in Manhattan. From 1975 to 1980, and, during the 1970s, a vacation home on Cutler Lane in Remsenburg, New York. For the move to the West Coast in 1981, he and his wife bought a home in West Hollywood. California previously owned by comedian Jack Benny's radio announcer, Don Wilson. In late September 2012, Lee underwent a surgical operation to insert a pacemaker into his body, cancelling planned appearances at conventions. Lee's favorite authors include Stephen King, H.G. Wells, Mark Twain, Arthur Conan Doyle, William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, and Harlan Ellison. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.